Good evening, everyone. So as uh, Honza said, my name is Jakub. So introduce a bit myself. I'll try to make it a bit smaller. Um, I'm a Python software slash data engineer slash scientist now working at Quantline. We are a, a trading company. We run our own trading platform. Most of the code base is uh, Python. Uh, and as Sian said, my roots uh, are rather long in, uh, in academia, and I was doing mostly numerical simulation in uh, fusion research. And today, I'll, it's my pleasure to talk about Python optimization for numerical calculation. So Python is slow. This is what I hear many times. And um, the question I pose today, it, is it really? And the answer is it depends. And, uh, and also the answer is, even if it's slow, we can optimize when appropriate. And uh, I'll try to give you some, um, some motivation and some overview of how you can actually do that. Um, now, um, you've heard maybe that premature optimization is the root of all evil. That's a frequently cited phrase. And it's, it's kind of true. So I'll follow that. Uh, because you, of, of, of course, you need to uh, assess, you need to know that if before you optimize, you need to decide what to optimize for. Typically, you have to trade the total costs, which are the development costs, human work, the computer time, and your gain is your profit. So don't try to optimize too early with an unknown goal. Uh, so what are the typical optimization goals is we often think of uh, faster execution, so less CPU time spent in a, in a calculation. We should also think about less memory consumption. That can be uh, because that can bring uh, resources, uh, like in, even in terms of money, if we run in the cloud or we need to buy the hardware. Uh, and we should also look into how the the performance scales with the problem size. Uh, so those are, the th I think, the three main things to, to, to optimize for. And also one nice uh, thing to remember always is that there's uh, a part of principle which states that 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. Now you can uh, change the numbers a bit, but for code it, me uh, it means that basically 80% of your CPU time is, uh, is spent in something like 20% of the source code. So your goal is to identify these 20% first and then to optimize those 20%. And don't forget to consult XKCD, of course. Uh, so to actually identify the 20%, the tool you would use is a profiler. So here I give you just short list of tools you that can be useful. I'm not going to touch this topic too much, or basically not at all. So uh, just keep it for reference. And instead what I, <coughs> what I assume that we've already found a good reason to optimize something, and we do that here to get today. And uh, the target of our optimization today is uh, a numerical calculation. If one were to optimize uh, something different, like a, like a uh, general Python code, the tools would be different. It might overlap, but in general, it could be quite different. So there, there's a test example, which I actually have stolen from Jake Wonder Plus talk, but it's no, nothing very special. It's an it's a Euclidean distance calculation of a, uh, of a set of uh, vectors. Uh, so, um, as I said, we are at the point that we have found that this is the bottleneck of, of, our, of our business. So let's, let's try to optimize that. Um, so uh, I'll start with, uh, uh, with just some random data as input, which I will use for throughout the presentation to demonstrate uh, the performance and the steps that I'm doing. Now, I, I think we probably 
all or most of us know that NumPy would be the number one choice to do this kind of uh, calculation in Python. Uh, here you see, I think I can make this bigger again. Um, so you see how this is uh, implemented in Python. And one particular thing that is handy in this case is, uh, is broadcasting. So NumPy can uh, kind of automatically broadcast or uh, extend the dimensions and then and we use it here to do uh, the pairwise uh, calculation and do uh, some reduction to actually get the results we want. So it's a, it's a one-liner, it's really short, uh, and it does the thing well. Now, um, I'm going to use uh, present time it, which is an IPython magic for, for just uh, getting some statistics about the runtime. So in the, in the background, it would run uh, the, the command that I give it uh, multiple times and get, it will get some, yield some statistics. And I was, I'm, I'm storing that into, into a dictionary, uh, which I would then use to compare the times. So uh, we are at 40 milliseconds for this, um, this case. Actually, this, uh, these results were just run before the presentation on my laptop, which is not the newest, most performant one. If you run it on your uh, server or, or even on a modern desktop, you would get probably lower numbers. And also, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but you can get very diff different results in terms of ordering the, the approaches. So let's, uh, let's ask whether, what, what kind of performance we get from Python loops. Um, uh, if, I, if I teach Python, which I do at the, the university, I typically emphasize that something like for i in range something is, is an anti, is a typical anti-pattern. And we, we often do either uh, iteration on some kind on, on the list and get the items themselves, but in numerics, we do vectorized um, operations with NumPy. Uh, but here, I will demonstrate how performant it is. And later I show that it's actually handy to have this implementation anyway. So here's a loop, um, uh, loop code that you would, that looks like a C code. So for those who are used to code in uh, C, C++, you, you would do that and it would run well. Uh, now if I run it, it takes five seconds, which is way much slower than the NumPy uh, performance. So here you see a comparison. Mind that the y-axis is in log scale. So we get something like two orders of magnitude difference in the runtime. Okay, so now we can, we would answer to our initial questions that Python is slow. Well, let's see. Um, as you probably know, we should really test that the function we are implementing is, um, is doing the, the right thing. So I'll just put in, <coughs> after uh, every implementation, I just do a simple assert. Now we can do that with uh, NumPy all and compare the numbers. It's not the best idea because we have floating point arithmetics. So what's better is to use all close, um, but with, uh, with a low tolerance. So we are pretty confident that we are happy with the result. So that's my assert we are happy function here. Okay. So number three, uh, possibility for, the, for, for optimizing the code that um, the function that I presented is Cyton. So Cyton is quite a mature tool. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of features. It's not just the feature that I would show here. Basically what it does, it extends the Python language, uh, particularly by, by C imports, so, so kind of C level uh, importing uh, libraries. Uh, then what it does, it, it translates um, the, 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 the Cyton source code 
which you would use uh, uh, with um, extension.py yx, which comes from Pyrex, which is the, the language that came basically before Cyton. And it translates it to, to C and C++ and compiles it into a Python module. So uh, it includes, what it adds is static typing. We'll make use of that. Uh, you can also conveniently code and uh, bind C or C++ uh, and so on. So it's, it's very powerful. So uh, if, um, if we just siphonize the, uh, the function that, that we implemented, and I'm taking a shortcut here using another IPython magic with a double percent siphon uh, minus A. So I run it on the implementation. Uh, and I'll actually switch to to the notebook view just to give you show you the output here. So the output, if you put minus A, would uh, mark by the yellow color the pieces of the code that are not optimized that Cyton things have too much interaction with Python. So uh, already from this color, you might guess that we are not optimizing the code. Uh, uh, to, uh, to make it better, we can, uh, we can static type some of the uh, variables that are used in the function. That's what I do here with these C devs, and in particular this one. And also on the interface, you see I already put NumPy, NumPy array. So this function now works only for NumPy two dimensional arrays. <coughs> and it, uh, it uses the static typing uh, to, to see the effect on the color. So you, I think if you compare, if you remember a bit, that picture before was much more yellow. Now you're getting less yellow, which is good. So Cyton doesn't like yellow. Uh, by the way, if also if you analyze this, there's this plus sign and button, and you can actually see what what um, what amount of work your um, your Python interpreter is doing internally to get you the, the very nice language and the high abstractions that we all love and that we use to code very fast. Um, okay, so let's test these two functions. Okay, I've done that before, so believe me, it really ran well. And uh, see the performance. So actually, the first version, or the zero version, uh, is a little bit slower. Okay, it's on par with, with the Python version, which is what you should expect in this case. It's not in general that if you run a Cyton on your, on your Python code, you would not gain a performance. It's just because we, are, we, we have just a tiny function where we just don't get anything. Now, the, the second version, so version one is, is already quite faster. It's in between the loops and NumPy version, so we are probably in the right direction. Um, and uh, if you then look into the uh, usual tricks that, Py that Cyton offers for this, cal this, uh, this, uh, this calculation, this optimization, you would find that if you switch off uh, checking the array bounds and if, and disabling um, uh, negative indexing. So you switch off some of the fancy, nice features that we have from Python and NumPy. What you get is less yellow, which is good. Here it comes. Uh, and if you look where the yellow lines are now, you probably don't see it really, but these are just the yellow lines that we can't get rid of because we just need to interact with Python somehow and we need to deliver 
Python objects back and import NumPy and, and so on. And what we actually gain is a performance that is much faster than NumPy. And I think that's a, that's a huge gain. So we've beaten NumPy by an order of magnitude by doing, starting with a dump style for loops, and by, by then by just adding a couple lines of Cython, decorator, and static typing. Yeah, so we are really happy with that. Um, okay. Maybe someone will tell you, okay, you should do it in Fortran. That's like the language for doing, uh, for doing uh, numerics, and it will just beat your Python totally. Um, so let's try. Uh, we, we are lucky that uh, NumPy guys were so smart that they created this F2Py code that they, people use uh, a lot to wrap Mm, Fortran or C. Uh, so then let's not be shy and do some Fortran. And I actually like the Fortran, at least the modern Fortran. It's um, it's not it's not a bad language. So the implementation for this case uh, looks pretty much like the the Python loops. I mean, you might uh, you you can spot uh, the nice double precision wording, so that's, that's the Fortran way of doing stuff. Uh, so, okay, uh, so the, there's not that much work that we need to do to actually get a, a, a Python module out of that code. So we run F2Py, we use actually some switches that we don't need. So we just put F2Py, we read the documentation, we, and we know that we just put this, the, the, the source code, file name, and minus M, the name of the module, and it should, should run. And uh, if you then import the module and look at the documentation of the, of the function that you just compiled, you would see the interface. So F2Py actually understood the dimensionality, the types, and it would report you uh, that in, uh, in the documentation. So it seems the interface is what we actually need, and we can test if, uh, if it runs well. One thing to remember is that Fortran uh, uses a different um, ordering than C, so to get the best performance, you should, uh, you should have the, the Fortran ordering in your matrices. Or arrays. Now it runs. It say the the time here is uh, under seven milliseconds. Uh, I'll show you the comparison in the in the plot. But when I see this, it's quite different than what I get on on my laptop. And uh, it's here we are touching um, the uh, quite some some low level. Uh, properties of your hardware, so it, and then the compiling switches and so on. So you might even want to tune the compilation further. Uh, and then, so this was Fortran, and the, the last tool I'll show you here briefly is Numba. And um, I really like it. It's, it's a super simple tool to use and pretty powerful. It, it does not do all, every, everything, it's not almighty. But um, it does it. Basically, it uses LLVM on the bottom. It's built for data and science, so for us. And it's straightforward to use. And, what it, and it compiles your Python code into a machine code. So uh, for, for our use case, we can just take number.jit, which is a just-in-time compiler decorator, there is a couple of options. Uh, I'll use the default for, for now. Uh, what one particular um, interesting one is, um, it's no Python, which uh, sounds scary. But it's, it really compiles Python, but internally it would refuse to run any code that depends on the Python runtime. It would fail for our, for our case, by the way. 
but it's, there's a workaround. You, that's not too difficult to, to make it work, but there's, there's no gain on the performance. So what I do here, I just decorate uh, my loops function. So again, not the NumPy one, and then compile it, or just in time compile it with number. Um, that's the same as in Cyton. It works. Of course, I would not show you if it did not. So uh, the time is now comparable, as if I remember well, to Cyton, to the best Cyton. So here it goes. Uh, so we have Cyton 2 number uh, just uh, very fast compared to the others. Uh, Fortran following, um, but when I ran it today on the laptop, Fortran was, I think the second number was the first one and Cyton the third one. So uh, don't draw too, too many conclusions from the ordering of this, these three, two, three. Okay, so I think we've done pretty good business on optimizing that small functions, small function. Now, uh, I also said we should look at the memory usage. Um, here I'm using a tool from our speaker from the last Pi, Pi Data Meetup, and I would just watch the memory using this tool. Um, and okay, here in the bottom, I run it for my original uh, X array, which is not too large, but it's a thousand times three. Uh, it doesn't seem, it doesn't take any memory, especially the peak memory is, is zero. That's good. Um, now, uh, when I try to run that on a little bit larger problem, so five times n, two times n, uh, so I call it xl here and run it on xl. If you can see it from over there, there is a peaked uh, memory of one gigabyte, uh, which can be um, a little bit unexpected. It's from the broadcasting thing. So if you think about what broadcasting does, it, it adds one more dimension. And so it creates a potentially huge, huge uh, array. Uh, and if you just add a, instead of 10 and four, instead of five and two, you would add a little bit more elements. You would run out of your memory if you are not running on a, on a big uh, computer. So be careful with that. And uh, actually, if you look at what the number version does, is that it takes, it, uh, it solves this issue for you. And it's kind of comes out from the solution. We are not doing, we are not constructing the big, the big array. We are just uh, looping. So that's another problem solved by Numba. Cyton would be the same here, of course, uh, because it's doing the, the, the looping similarly. So, yeah. so um, yeah, the first um, quote is from this uh, presentation, so feel free to cite it from now on. Uh, okay, so I think parallelization is kind of, um, comes along with, with optimization. It can be a way to, to make your code run faster. My, um, my advice is, is uh, try to use what's available as much as possible. Try to be on, rather on the high level. Don't do the low level parallelization, although I'll show you the low level today more. Uh, uh, typically, uh, you need to run something like a map on, on a number of, of inputs. So you can use, um, you don't need to parallelize the internal of the code. Uh, and also avoid threads. I'll show you threads again, or that we can use threads, but the advice is don't try to do it yourself if you're not well aware of what you are doing. And also because the infamous gear, which um, would 
prevent you from doing uh, failing, but it's actually helping you not doing uh, terrible mistakes. <laughs> um, right, so in, in Python, in the standard lib, there's a module called Concurrent Futures. If you read the documentation, there's, there's not too many, uh, um, not too much stuff in there. You find two uh, basic uh, classes, executor, which is something that would execute, as I mean, the name would say, <laughs> the uh, um, uh, functions on, in either a threat pool or process pool or, you, uh, or any pool that other libraries can, can expose. And um, there's, there's Dask or Apply Parallel, which are quite well known. Maybe less known is that there's also MPI for Py, which is an, a message passing library for Python, which also exposes an executor. That's fairly interesting. And then you have the future uh, class, which is an, uh, an asynchronous result, a promise of a result, uh, which is returned by, by the executor. So uh, just a simple example. I won't use it for our problem now. And I'll actually probably make it very fast because I'm running not out of time, but close to the end. So if, so the, the, the parallel map, if you have uh, a number of inputs you want to map uh, a function on, just use an executor that is suitable for you. Now, thread pool might be usable. I'm using it here now because it's the simplest one to spin off but it might not deliver you any parallelization. It can, though, especially with NumPy, Pandas, they often release your evil gil, so they, you, you can make use of threads if you are using those libraries. Uh, then, you, so what you get is, uh, is, are those future results, uh, and typically you somehow need to synchronize, you need to wait for them, so there's there's wait uh, function in concurrent futures, um, and then once these are done, you can just collect the results in a, in a list, for example, as I'm doing here. There's also a map uh, map method of the executor which would do about the same, but would just yield uh, an, a generator. So you you would work with that a little bit differently. You would not get the futures themselves here. Uh, now I al already mentioned Dask and IPy Parallel that offer uh, very easy to use uh, scalable cluster executors uh, which can either run on your local machine or can even run on a, on a cluster and so you just uh, run on your colleagues laptops you just run one single command and you can get a cluster out of your office in a, in a minute or so. Uh, this is, I think, what I just said, so let me skip that. And now um, a little bit on parallelizing the code that we actually uh, targeted today. Um, I'll use Numba again. Uh, there's a parallel argument to JIT, which that's what it uh, says it does, is try to parallelize the code. You should also use P range, so a parallel range instead of range. Uh, and uh, you, should, you should see if the code is, is easily parallelizable, with, which uh, is our case, um, an increase of performance, so usage of more cores at, at the same time. Uh, I mentioned MPI for Pi. Uh, aside of executor, you can, of course, use it for la rather la large scale uh, scenarios where you need to send messages, typically short messages, in and out from, uh, from a pool of, of processes, potentially across your, your large cluster, and it makes it easy to send, uh, send Python objects. Uh, it's also performant for NumPy arrays. Um, and you don't have to use the raw MPI protocol, which is rather simplistic. And there's just primitive types that 
you can um, uh, you can use. And also, such a just briefly, what Dask offers in its high high level collections and can also do some parallelization. So uh, for Numba, it takes just the same JIT with parallel equals to and replacement of the first range by P range. If you go through the, through the loop, you would see that you can really uh, make the, the, the inside of the first loop or even the second one independent. It doesn't matter how, the, how it's ordered. And if you do that, uh, you assert that you are happy, uh, you execute the parallel version or time the parallel version, you can get times that are really faster than your previous number run. So it makes use of, of your threads or cores efficiently with almost zero effort. That's another good result, I think. And now just really fast crawl through desk. Uh, I'll show you how array, which is one of the high level collection can be used, what it is, uh, but please consult the documentation or the desk tutorial to, to learn uh, more. So here I create an array collection. So that would be a, a desk version of a NumPy array, but it's, it's made for out of core distributed uh, calculations. Since we will use it for a, for a small problem, it's not really helping us, but we can see the principles. Uh, one of the principles you need to follow is that you, you specify how large chunks of the data you have. So, and once you create that object, um, you have this the delayed uh, function or decorator that, uh, that you use and that Dask uses to, to actually uh, create a call graph instead of executing functions and then executing the call graph. Uh, so this is what, how you can create a delayed fun function from an existing function. But if we do actually want to um, implement our pairwise function, we can just plug in the Dask array into the place where we have our NumPy array, and it would create the call graph, which, and we can do it step by step, in fact, so I'm um, taking the first step here. So you see it would chunk into two, and then schedule the, the calculation, plan the calculation. Okay. So there's two more steps uh, with the sum and square root. Here is the final graph. You check that it's doing the right thing. Um, and actually, the, the time it takes here on a local computer is slower, but not, not too, too much slower than the, num than the Cyton version. So, uh, it, in principle, should scale better for large arrays, especially if they don't fit into your memory. It would be able to do it. So, this is the way if you want, if you need to scale for, for larger problems. That, and I'm not going to show this because. I would like to end with this slide already. So my summary is you use Python for numerics. There's powerful tools that exist for optimizing calculations. You can have very efficient uh, optimization with, and with little effort with uh, the JIT decorator from Numba. Uh, be careful with NumPy uh, memory consumption in, in, if it's doing broadcasting. Uh, by the way, the, uh, there was a, a quote for, from Wes McKinney, the, the author of Pandas, and uh, his rule of thumb is that your memory should be 
something like five to ten times larger than the size of, of your Pandas data frame, which is what people might not guess for if, if they come to Pandas. And then one of the reason is, uh, reasons is, is uh, of course, this because NumPy is used heavily in, in Pandas. Also remember concurrent futures. If you have not, uh, have not found that yet in your Python library, look it up, use it. And uh, for referring to this, these slides, it's all available on GitHub for free. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for a nice talk. And uh, so there are some questions on Slido. That's very good. I'm, I'm really glad that you have done that. Uh, but first, we should probably ask if there's someone who is not shy to ask aloud this question or a question. Uh, probably not. Maybe it's fine. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, sorry. I'm not sure if I can hear on the video, so maybe you should repeat the question. Uh, regarding that, uh, uh, we have seen the visualization of the communication graph. There, there's some similarities for sure. Uh, there's a lot of tools that would actually construct uh, a call graph and then execute it on engine and workers. Uh, if you look into Spark, it would be similar also. So TensorFlow, I think, is different in that sense that you have more emphasis on tensor algebra in, in, your, uh, in the nodes of the graph. While here, it's, uh, well, Dask would have also the algebra, but you can also put arbitrary Python functions. OK, so another physical question? Maybe. If you try to compare your routine to some other languages like, I don't know, Java. Of what then? Yeah, um, uh, so. The question is to, to compare the performance or um, well, I think the answer is it, it depends again because as, as I showed here, you can you can be on par with the Fortran code, which I think is uh, is spectacular almost. Um, uh, Fortran would be on the similar speed as a C. Uh, the coding would take you much more time if you do a, if you start from C, for sure. So, this is my one of my first advices is uh, because in Python, if you are a decent Python programmer, you would code fast, prototype fast. You find your bottlenecks first, and then you can fall back to either some of these tools, and even maybe Fortran, C, C++. Java is a bit difficult to interface to Python. So with Java, you are a bit drifting out of this meetup community. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so then let's, let's give some chance also to Slido so to encourage you to, to post more questions. Uh, so the question that actually got two votes, uh, a mm -hmm. reminder for the second part uh, of, of, of the meetup, uh, it is possible to vote for, for questions that you want to really be asked. Uh, so uh, question. I could not vote. You, you could not? You see, <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the question is, uh, the, the, the result, uh, should we use num number for Everything is it the, the optim, optimal tool to, to do everything, or is there any like place for Cyton or F two Pi? No, we can't use it. We certainly can't use it for everything. And uh, I think the the way to use it is to localize what needs to be made fast, uh, and then uh, compile that that piece. One of the reasons is that uh, seeing errors from a, from a number. Uh, optimized function is more difficult than from Python. So if you don't need that performance, don't decorate it, don't use Cyton. And uh, Numba, uh, at least at this stage, is not replacing Cyton completely. There's, there's a lot of features that Cyton has and Numba does not. OK, 
Okay, thank you. And the last, last question, if you can give a brief answer. Uh, have you tried PyPy? <laughs> yeah, there was a, a kind of actually a discussion on uh, my, one of uh, the, the, the function that I'm profiling, basically. And um, I'm not using PyPy. I admit that I sh maybe I should try it more often. But the, the reason I'm not using PyPy is the lack of uh, all the NumPy ecosystem. Uh, so PyPy is awesome. It's got a lot of uh, just-in-time compilation features. If you run, if you, if you implement uh, that code, and actually thanks to people that are sitting somewhere around here that did the benchmark just before, so just in time before, <laughs> before we started uh, this meetup, uh, it runs very fast if you implement it in Python using lists and running on PyPy, uh, which is very good. It even, even Python can run faster than in, uh, indexing NumPy arrays. But um, uh, NumPy would then, it, it would not scale up or out if, if you like all the NumPy bound tools and the, the algebra that already is in NumPy and the tools around. So I think that's still a shortcoming of, of PyPy. Not sure if it can be resolved, but I'm not that much of an expert on PyPy, really. So thanks again, and this uh, ends our first half of this meetup. So thank you again. <laughs>